Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Grand Teton National Park in northwest Wyoming. The park is located only about 130 miles to the south of Yellowstone National Park and rivals it with its beauty and wildlife. Elevation in the park starts at 6,320 feet in Jackson Hole and stretches to 13,770 feet at the park's highest point, Grand Teton. The barren granite peaks give way to thick forests of pine, fir, and spruce trees, with quaking aspen groves dominating in pockets across the valleys. Near Jackson Lake is a trail system that travels eastward to Emma Matilda Lake and Two Ocean Lake. The Emma Matilda Lake Trail encircles Emma Matilda Lake in a loop that runs almost 12 miles. It wanders through meadows and trees as cool breezes waft off the lake to refresh visitors as they hike. Stands of buffalo berries offer a tasty treat to passers-by and sustain the wildlife in their season. Common animals in this area include elk, moose, and mule deer. Predators in this area include black bear, bobcats, cougars, coyotes, and wolves. But the most powerful are the massive grizzlies that frequent the trails. During the second week of August 1994, 36-year-old Michael and Linda Dunn were camping with their three children at the Coulter Bay Campground along Jackson Lake. Their family had a standing vacation spent at the lake each year and enjoyed the time together each summer. Michael was thin but athletic, standing six feet in height and weighing a healthy 165 pounds. He was a scout leader back in their hometown of Park City, Utah, and had even completed bear attack training with his pack of scouts. Michael was a successful senior writer at Fotherington & Associates, eventually landing the same position with Bonneville Communications. His life was centered around serving his community, and he took pride in his campaigns for a Major League Baseball team, as well as the Salvation Army. Michael and Linda were not only life partners, but they were running partners. Together, they had completed 50 marathons combined, including several ultra-marathons. They valued the lessons running instilled in them, teaching their kids that they could still find joy while doing difficult things. They had even completed an Ironman race together. On this particular day, Michael wanted to go on a longer run, and Linda agreed to stay behind with the kids. As Michael prepared for his early morning run on August 14th, he had a sense of doom wash over him. He knew it was something he'd have to work through and hit the trail before sunup. Falling into an easy pace, his mind began reflecting on lessons he found valuable. As a member of the Latter-day Saint Church, he felt running in the mountains helped him clear his mind and meditate. He used this solitary time running to pray and seek direction from God. As he bounced along the trail, he reflected on the prior day's run. That morning had been moistened by the dew, and as he entered a meadow, he decided it would be a beautiful place for his morning prayers. Inspired by the sunlight breaking across the cloud-shrouded peaks, he knelt down and prayed aloud a prayer of gratitude when two words popped into his mind. Play dead. The meaning of these words were confusing to him that morning, but would be very important this morning. Only a few hundred yards into his run, Michael noticed a strange bush near the trail. Around the base of this bush were several buffalo berries that had been dislodged from their stems. The tiny tomato-like fruits led Michael's eyes to the indelible impression of a large grizzly track deeply embedded into the dirt near the bush. Perhaps out of nervous relief, but definitely as a precaution, Michael decided he would start singing out loud as he ran. He didn't pack a firearm, nor did he pack bear spray on any of his runs. Around two miles into his run, Michael's nerves began to settle down, and he quit singing out loud. As he rounded a bend in the trail, he was discombobulated by a loud, deep rumble just off the trail a few yards from him. At first he thought a boulder was rolling down the slope, but turned around to see a huge grizzly sow bellowing at him from only fifteen yards away. He stared at her as events unfolded in slow motion in his mind. He could see the muscles in the hump of her shoulder ripple as she blew through every limb and bush between them. Popping and cracking sounded as she growled a thundering roar as she bore down on him. Michael immediately began to run and scream in terror. 
She caught up to him within only a few yards and barreled into him like a freight train, knocking him nine feet off the trail. It seemed that the sow was on top of him before he even hit the ground. He yelled for help and punched the sow in the face as she slashed at his flesh. Her roaring and growling gave way to eerily silent and furious swats with her claws. Each time the bear tried to bite him, Michael tried to squirm out of the way. He screamed at the top of his lungs, trying to frighten the bear, but felt himself panicking as he felt the sow's claws rip through his neck, legs, and arms. With a single swat, she flipped him over onto his stomach and wrapped her claws around the right side of his face. She was standing on his back and pulled his head up toward his rear end, trying to break his neck. As one of her claws slipped from his mouth, it tore a deep gash from the corner of his mouth to above and behind his right ear. He hoped that the bear would stop her attack, but realized that she was doing what bears do, kill their prey. Thoughts of his wife and kids flashed through his mind. He wondered if he would ever see them again, and decided to do the only thing he could, pray. The bear was far too powerful for him to resist her ferocity. He curled into the fetal position and focused on slowing his breathing and remaining still. The bear suddenly glanced around as if it had heard something nearby. It dashed off about twenty yards down the trail and stood to its hind feet. Michael marveled at the bear as it stood to what he estimated to be seven to nine feet in height. The sow dropped to all fours and disappeared into the trees as if something was chasing her. After the sow disappeared, Michael knew he was severely injured. He was afraid she would come back and quickly regained his feet. His blood poured from so many wounds on his body that he couldn't tell precisely where it was coming from. He knew he needed to do something to stop the bleeding, so he removed his shirt and ripped it into ribbons. Michael wrapped the ribbons around his gashed thigh as a makeshift tourniquet. None of his bones seemed to be broken, so he knew that he had to put as much distance as he could between himself and the sow. The closest place Michael knew he'd be able to find help was back at Jackson Lodge near Jackson Lake, about five miles away. He wasn't sure if he could make it all the way back to the lodge, but knew he could make himself easier to find for possible rescuers. As he limped his way back down the trail, he was presented with a confusing series of trail junctions that could have led him further from help. Somehow he made his way for one mile before deciding to lay down and rest in a beautiful meadow. Michael laid in the trail for about 45 minutes before a man and two women stumbled upon him. They were photographers visiting the park and were hailed by Michael for help. The man agreed to run for help and clomped his way down the trail along a fire road in his heavy hiking boots. The women stayed with Michael, wrapping him in a blanket and carefully giving him sips of water to keep him comfortable. Around 90 minutes later, a park ranger hiked up to Michael's location with a first aid kit. He was followed by a second ranger, who notified the group that a helicopter was en route to evacuate Michael. Back at Coulter Bay Campground, Linda began to wonder where Michael had gone. She knew he wanted to go for a longer run, but he should have been back a long time ago. She rounded up the kids, and they all got on their bikes and pedaled toward the lodge to get some help in finding him. As they rode, they ran into some park rangers who informed them that Michael had been attacked by a grizzly bear and was on a helicopter to St. John's Hospital in Jackson Hole. Rangers began an immediate investigation into Michael's attack. They measured the distance on the trail to the point where he was attacked, about 2.1 miles. They analyzed the bear tracks as she ran toward Michael and measured the distance between where he was struck and where he had landed at 9.2 feet. The bushes between where she impacted him and where he had landed had been flattened by the sheer power of the sprinting bear. At his attack scene, the rangers found his carbon fiber sunglasses with a clear pointed dent in them where the sow's claw had impacted. His sunglasses prevented Michael from losing an eye that day. Once Michael arrived at St. John's, he had a run of good luck. A world-renowned trauma surgeon happened to be visiting that day and helped save Michael's life. Upon observing Michael's injuries, they marveled that two of the bear's claws tore parallel gashes through his thigh and perfectly paralleled his femoral artery in the middle in between them. They created a deep wound channel that the artery fell into, protecting it from any further damage. They were also amazed that the deep gash to his neck missed his carotid artery by a millimeter. Had either one of these injuries severed one of those major arteries, Michael would have bled to death in seconds. Michael's arms, legs, neck, and back were covered in deep gashes and bites. They were similar to injuries sustained in a high-speed motorcycle accident. Michael made it through two surgeries in the following three days to close 16 wounds that required 300 stitches. The surgeries were successful, and Michael's condition was improved to stable. 
The following nights, Michael would wake up fighting the bear off and imagined attacks that tortured him and his family. The mental anguish from the attack would require therapy for months to come. During his seven-day stay in the hospital, Michael's children visited him. In order to soften the blow of seeing their father torn to ribbons, he asked them if they understood what this means. They stared back blankly in their childhood innocence, and he said they should never feed the bears. It took Michael a third surgery and weeks of painful rehabilitation to regain the ability to walk with a limp. Within one year, he completed the St. George Marathon in personal record time and went on to run in the Boston Marathon the following spring. Wearing a bear-patterned shirt and sporting teddy bear gifts on his table, his sense of humor has helped him and his family deal with the stress. A bear crossing sign was posted outside his front door by friends just to lighten his mood whenever he saw it. Michael Dunn was the first person to be attacked by a grizzly bear in Teton National Park's 54-year history. His family has returned to Jackson Lake each year, and Michael has been left with a greater desire to serve people and break outside his own private world. As for the sow and her cubs, I could find no source indicating that any action was taken against her or her cubs. She was left to raise her cubs unfettered by human intervention, given her defensive actions were deemed to be within the expected behavior of a sow grizzly protecting herself and her cubs. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think Michael should have listened to his feeling of impending doom before he went on his run? Do you think the words, play dead, popping into his head after his prayer in the meadow, were a harbinger from his guardian angel? Was it divine intervention that no major artery was severed during Michael's attack, or just good luck? I'll be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.